Okay, good afternoon. Sorry, good, good afternoon. Yeah, maybe good evening if you're in Singapore. Uh, good afternoon if you're in London and welcome to the um, second of this uh, lecture series, um, Decolonizing Curating and the Museum in Southeast Asia. This is jointly run by um, the Asian Civilizations Museum Singapore and the SOAS Southeast Asian Art Academic Program. Uh, my name is Stephen Murphy. I'm going to be moderating this uh, panel uh, today. Um, I'm currently the uh, senior lecturer at um, SOAS. Um, yeah, and just um, quick, be just before we start, um, oops. Yeah, we have uh, six lectures in total in the series. Um, these are the uh, four upcoming ones in the, the every Thursday. Um, just to note that there is a little bit of a time change for the last two because um, because we're working over different um, time zones, uh, the clocks go forward and, and back at different times and different locations. So um, the last two will actually be at 11 a.m. in, in, in uh, UK time, but remain at, at 7 p.m. in Singapore time. Okay, and there was questions last week about um, where the uh, recordings will be, and, and they'll be on the Center for Southeast Asian Studies uh, homepage. At SOAS, there's the, um, the link there, but if you just Google that as well, it will take you there. Just bear with us because sometimes it takes us a few days um, to get the, the recordings up, but we will get them up there within the space of hopefully um, a week at least, or at the latest. So anyway, without any further ado, I will stop sharing my slide. Um, I want to introduce uh, today's speakers. Um, they will both, that's uh, Pamela and Corey and uh, Vera May, they will present for about um, 40 minutes. And then we have a, a discussant, um, Shabir Hussein Mustafa, um, and they will have a discussion after that. And then for the last 25 minutes or so, we'll open up it up to a Q&A uh, to the audience. Um, so without further ado, let me just introduce the first two speakers. Uh, at this point, um, Pamela and Corey is an assistant professor uh, in art and media studies at the Fulbright University of Vietnam. Uh, she was previously lecturer in Southeast Asian art uh, at SOAS, a colleague of mine. We crossed, we crossed paths for about six months. Um, she is the author of uh, The City and Time, Contemporary Art and Urban Form in Vietnam and Cambodia. That's with the University of Washington Press, 2021. And the other speaker tonight is uh, Vera May, and she's actually a, a PhD candidate here at SOAS, but she's in New Zealand right now. So again, thank you for another time zone uh, difference. I know it's late at night as well, so we appreciate you joining us. Um, before this, she spent several years working as a contemporary art curator at St. Paul's Gallery uh, at UT Australia, uh, sorry, at UT University in New Zealand, and the NTU Center for Contemporary Art Singapore, among many others. Um, talk today, this evening, is called Mining the Museum, Contemporary Art and Decolonial Practice in Southeast Asia. So without any further ado, uh, Vera, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Okay, greetings. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Stephen, and to the Southeast Asian Art Academic Program for having us, as well as the Asian Civilizations Museum, and to Conan Chung for organizing on that end. So our presentation today is called Mining the Museum, Contemporary Art and Decolonial Practice in Southeast Asia. Uh, and first I'll be um, discussing a little bit about um, some of the inspiration, I guess, for this talk before we uh, divide into our respective uh, inquiries into artworks uh, from the region. So in 1992, the American artist Fred Wilson worked with the Maryland Historical Society and the Contemporary Organization to excavate materials and objects from the society's collection. What resulted was a profound exhibition, Mining the Museum, which disrupted a conventionally polite and passive museum display of beautiful things that celebrate American history. The artist dared to exhibit what is often hidden in plain sight, the evidence of the invisible forced and violent labor that enables wealthy settler colonies like the US to produce beautiful objects. This artwork emerged from a period in art history where women and people of color in particular were expanding ideas of conceptual art to include direct and biting forms of institutional critique. Seeing inherent blind spots in existing art historical and institutional representation, 
these artists use methods of intervention, performance, and direct contact with museum and gallery structures to critique and update museum representation. And, sorry. Um, In 1989, uh, the American artist Andrea Fraser staged museum highlights at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, where she posed as a museum tour guide and pointed out unseen aspects of the museum or overlooked aspects of the museum, such as the shop, the toilet, the cloakroom, and witty and ironic language, kind of parroting the idea of a you know, uh, museum docent tour. So Wilson uh, exists in this lineage of artists who have been underrepresented by the museum and uses the museum itself as a medium. In mining the museum, uh, Fred Wilson uses careful choreography of objects to create jarring juxtapositions. So for example, upon entering the exhibition, uh, as seen in this image here, visitors were greeted by the busts of American statesmen, Henry Clay, Napoleon Bonaparte, and Andrew Jackson, a supporter and profiteer of slavery directly opposite are uh, empty pedestals labeled Benjamin Banneker, Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, all freed slaves who are crucial to advancing freedom for African Americans. Their presence uh, is highlighted by Wilson through their absence, screaming at the biases inherent in museum collections. Perhaps the most well known uh, of this exhibition that it often circulates is uh, the artwork uh, intervention Metalworks 1793-1880, where iron slave shackles were inserted into the same cabinet as opulent silverware, which undoubtedly belonged to slave owners. Wilson also highlights objects from the collections as anthropomorphic forms, such as cabinet making, where these um, sort of beautiful pieces of furniture were positioned as people standing around a whipping post, watching something brutal take place. The effect is an unease and discomfort at how both of these objects, often segregated from each other, are actually related. On one end of the spectrum is cruel violence, and on the other end is objects uh, demonstrative of beauty. In Wilson's exhibit, they exist directly uh, and visually on the same spectrum. Wilson's artwork was a display of epistemic disobedience because it disrupted the exhibitionary complex, showing a direct correlation between an immoral means of production and its beautiful output. Ultimately, the simple yet profound gesture of insertion disrupts the civilizing mission of the museum. It was a form of speaking back to power from the voice of an outsider smuggled in, forcing museum goers to confront a painful past and listen. Okay, I'll pass on to Pamela now. Okay, thank you, Vera. Um, so Wilson's intervention was hailed by established literature scholar and theorist of decoloniality, Walter Mignolo, as an exemplary act of aesthetic and epistemic disobedience. For Mignolo, the exhibit ex established a decolonizing perspective through its intervention into the logic of knowledge and the logic of beauty intrinsic to the didactic work of museums. As such, it turns the museum into what Minulo describes as an alternative site of learning, learning to unlearn the principles that justified museums and universities, and to formulate a new horizon of understanding and of human living conditions beyond the sacred belief that accumulation is the secret for a decent life." End quote. With the notion of disobedience, Minulo is referring more to the process of unveiling and in so doing, undoing the rhetoric that sustains a relationship between the aesthetic and the epistemic, particularly as they have long been defined by and in turn define universal structures of taste, knowledge, and subjectivity shaped by historical developments and ideologies linked to the colonial project. Perhaps the artist himself most succinctly described this kind of work. So this is a quote from Fred Wilson. I'm interested in beauty, if you think of beauty as an ultimate visual experience, but I'm also interested in beauty in that it can hide meaning. The world is complex and often we try to separate out all these experiences. This is beautiful, this is ugly, 
this is a beautiful experience, that's all it is. There is no meaning, or the meaning is not important. People have to deal with the fact that there is meaning in beauty, there is meaning in ugliness. So in a lot of my work, I try to, if I can, bring out that tension. The whipping post and chairs is a perfect example because the chairs are really beautiful. That whipping post is certainly not. It's a very traditional display in a certain way. There's no manipulation of the objects other than their positioning. And that changes the meaning or their relationship or how you think about them. Looking at high-end decorative arts in the chairs and the whipping post, they have a very different history, but it relates very directly in that those people who sat in the chairs had some relationship with those who were on the whipping post. At roughly the same time that mining the museum took place at the Maryland Historical Society, Another example of aesthetic and epistemic disobedience was unfolding at various museum sites around the world. In a series of satirical performances titled The Couple in the Cage, Two Undiscovered Amerindians Visit the West by Coco Fusco and Guillermo Gomez Pena, the artists performed and exhibited themselves as representatives of an indigenous peoples from the fictitious island of Guatanaui. One of the performances took place at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, which had displayed human subjects during the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. The performances <clears throat> and footage and interviews with audience members were filmed for a documentary titled The Couple in the Cage, A Guatanaui Odyssey. The documentary showed that the satirical nature of the performances was not read as such by many, if not most, of the audiences, thus demonstrating that there were colonialist residues of cultural essentialism, racism, and ignorance that continued to inform the ways in which people encountered and accepted such a spectacle, especially when sanctioned by the context of the museum setting. In our presentation today, Vera and I will share additional examples of contemporary artworks inspired by and or set against the museological context. Works that ask questions about the gaps in historical narratives constructed through objects, the performativity and materiality of such objects, as well as non-objects in relation to decolonizing discourses of reparation. I'll pass things over to Vera now to share a work by Prachaya Pintong. Great, thanks Pamela. Okay, so how do we create and listen to decolonizing practices in Southeast Asia? What are they exactly? Southeast Asia is a region where by and large colonial emancipation has been gained. If decolonization can be defined by the need to bring about reparations of indigenous land and life, then we're in a situation where lands have been returned, but we still have not disentangled from the colonial matrix of power as Mignolo suggests. Decolonization in this context must surely operate beyond the nation's strict contours and involved unlearning from what theorist Franz, Franz Fanon might consider the colonized mind. Methods of colonization are also not only the takeover of lands, but also can persist in insidious forms. A region so vast with different religions, languages, and not only different colonizers, but different methods of colonization deserves much more nuanced scrutiny. The etymology of the word culture comes from the word cultivation or the tilling of the land, the act of preparing the earth for crop, hinting towards an idea that all forms of culture can carry colonial dimensions. Theorist uh, Walter Mignolo cites the uh, Bandung 1955 Asia Africa Conference or the Conferency Asia Africa as the moment where decoloniality was first thought of as a conscious delinking to Western power. This watershed event is uniquely when Asia and Africa are politically, politically gathered without the West and were unified through the mission of anti-racism and anti-colonialism. 
Bandung was a refusal of economic subordination and cultural suppression and the emergence of the third world as not a place but a project. After all, Bandung enabled Asia and uh, Africa to, um, and I'm quoting here the scholar Vijay Prashad, produce its own image. Uh, although often remembered just as much for its failures as well as its somewhat mythic and romantic political union of two unlikely partners, Bandung set forth a symbolic precedence for two mutually subjugated uh, continents to meet together and develop a lateral connection. And it's with these connections in mind, I am going to attempt to think through the uh, project by the Thai artist Prachea Pintong, which is called Broken Hill and was exhibited at the Chisholm Hale Gallery in London in 2013. I should disclose that the artist himself has not framed this project as consciously decolonizing. Uh, this is my reading and because it carries gestures of speaking back to power through highlighting the human agency of objects. This project echoes the legacy and epistemic disobedience that Fred Wilson set forth. It also speaks to other timely issues within this discussion of decolonization, not least because I argue it activates a form of resource distribution, which is critical to the task of decolonization. And it does this through the act of study via the covert action of smuggling. And these are ideas that I'll continue to delve into. So Broken Hill uh, began with the artist Prachaya Pintong's visit to Zambia, accompanying uh, his friend and filmmaker, uh, Jack Rawal Nim Nil Nimtarong, upon hearing about a replica of the Broken Hill man skull in Kwabe, which is an established mining district in Zambia. The skull is the first historically significant human fossil found in Africa. It was retrieved through an extraction mission by Australian miners in 1921 and found by Swiss miner Tom Zwigler, uh, who was accompanied by an unnamed African miner in historical documents. The skull amassed curiosity uh, for its shape, conforming to evidence of Homo heidelbergensis, and is approximately 299,000 years old, which according to experts is actually quite a young skull. Um, and this shape of the, the skull and the cranium in particular would give further fuel to Charles Darwin's theory of evolution that we uh, human beings are descendants from apes. The skull was taken to London by the British, British colonial authority somewhat dubiously and entered into the Natural History Museum's collection. So true to uh, Prachaya Pintong's uh, style of working closely with other people, he commissioned Zambian filmmaker Musola Catherine Kasaketi to make a short film about the skull and gave her free reign to decide the content. And it's in this uh, short film that the artists uh, visit the Lusaka um, National Museum, which is the site of the replica of the skull. And it's clear uh, from their encounter with the tour guide that there is demand from local authorities for the skull to be returned. And he also notices that the, uh, the guide at the museum, Mr. Mr. Kwanfa Chishala, uh, seems very exasperated at um, having to tell the story about the skull, but having to use a replica in order to illustrate the story. Uh, the voices in the film respectfully refer to the skull as the Broken Hill Man Skull, which contrasts to the Natural History Museum's reference of the Broken Hill Skull. And the simple semantic shift already reveals, I guess, the different relationships between um, the different specimens and human agencies involved. And in um, Zambia, a local playwright also refers to the skull as Kasanda Malombe, which means wealth mul multiplier. So that also adds a kind of another meaning to the skull as well. The plea uh, at the end of Kasukiti's film uh, for repatriation speaks directly to this urgent tasks that I think museums are facing around object restitution. However, there are also other interesting aspects at play within this exhibition, particularly as it sits within the framework of a contemporary artist project. To borrow the object um, from Zambia, Pintong's uh, for the exhibition at the Chisholm required a formal loan agreement and a museum guide uh, that had to travel as security with the object uh, from Zambia to London. Pintong adhered to these requests, requests and instead of passively putting on the exhibition with just the replica skull uh, and the you know, museum guide as just a sort of uh, travel vessel, he also actually invited Mr. Uh, Chishala to travel to London for the duration of the exhibition and to directly give the story of the skull to visitors. So when audiences visited the Chisholm Hale, they would not only see the replica skull that had moved to London and in interestingly was now only um, seven miles away from the original skull, but they also got to meet Mr. Chishala. 
and it's in its place at the um, Lusaka National Museum. Um, Pintong also bought another replica skull from the internet, which stood in place of the borrowed replica. So um, during their time in London, both um, Pintong and Mr. Chisala visited the original skull um, at the National History Museum collection. And Mr. Chisala also took photographs of his time in London, ranging from really touristic shots of London to things that he was interested in during his stay, um, including the Natural History Museum, but also just uh, touring London. And these photos were added to the exhibition in a kind of clever reversal of the lens from being kind of mere specimen to having command of the gaze, layering the replica skull at the Chisholm Hill with biography and subjectivity. And it's these moments of communion, um, working with Prachaya and you know, visiting the National History Museum, throughout these projects that has resonances with the act of study. And the idea of study um, that I'm drawing upon is defined by theorists Stefano Hani and Fred Moten is this idea of getting together with those that you care about and figuring out what needs to be learned. Moten uh, in particular defines study as not only the formal site of institutions, but rather that it's an inherently collective and political activity. Um, something that he says means, and I'm quoting him here, being committed to the idea that study is what you do with other people. It's talking and walking around with other people, working, dancing, suffering, some irreducible convergence of all three held under the name of speculative practice. And that's the end of the quote. So upon uh, Pintong's initial visit to Zambia, for example, there was no immediate output or exhibition in mind per se. It was more of a process of listening to those, um, you know, in, in particular Mr. Chishala and the filmmaker that he was working with um, and listening to what they wanted to do and figuring out what would happen if this kind of story was placed on, I guess, an international platform, like an exhibition at a contemporary art space. Pintong, the artist of the exhibition, um, is mostly in the background and looking through documentation. Um, some, most of the images, you know, he's kind of a, a reflection or in the background or, um, yeah, with Mr. Chishala. So very much kind of a, a figure that isn't prominent. Um, from my understanding, he also gave little instructions, both to Mr. Chisala and to the filmmaker Kazakiti, saying only that it all belongs to you, so it all belongs to them. And the artist's sharing of resources open up, opens up the entry passage often needed, and in some respects was smuggled in through the framework of being a contemporary art project. And working with Mr. Chisala, Pintong says that giving responsibilities away is a platform to share possibilities. The idea of smuggling is seen as a curatorial tactic by scholar and curator Eric Rogoff, where it can be defined as uh, a quote, a form of surreptitious transfer of clandestine transfer from one realm into another and a principle of movement of fluidity and of dissemination that disregards boundaries. Within this movement, the identity of the objects themselves are obscured. They are not visible or identifiable. They, are, they function very much like concepts and ideas and inhabit a space in a quasi-legitimate way." End of quote. So it's a space of contemporary art and the fluidity of a contemporary artist project that facilitates the transfer of the replica skull from Zambia to London, along with the subjectivity uh, and the experience of its guide and guardian, Mr. Chishala, in a way that I believe, you know, a much more traditional museum, like the Natural History Museum, for example, would probably not facilitate or allow. So the simple yet radical act of sharing space symbolically and bringing Mr. Um, Quant for, uh, Mr. Chisala to London and facilitating and resourcing his trip and experience to London adds a very direct layer of resource distribution. Sharing the resource of this exhibition platform and the financial resource of producing the exhibition with the guide and the filmmaker also acknowledges that it can be a challenging um, act to find a podium in which to speak and to speak in a way in which others will listen. This contrasts quite heavily with the often extractionist and transactional curatorial practices of international museums and galleries, which often just take objects or parade the final product of acquiring objects or staging exhibitions as a kind of uh, window dressing exercise of diversity. And unanimously from all accounts that I've heard uh, and, and read about from uh, about people who visit the exhibition is that audience often remark how lovely it is um, to uh, meet Mr. Chisala and how passionate it is to hear the story about the broken hill man skull from him. We could unpack further aspects of Prachaya's involvement as a Thai artist from, um, from Thailand, a country which had no formal colonizers but has been described as internally colonized by Thai scholar Tong Chai 
win a chikul, or we could even further try and understand how resource refusal, for example, has been a strategy of keeping independent nations like Zambia and other African countries dependent on these international stages. Uh, both of these aspects, I guess, speak directly to the sustained interest in Pintong's artistic practice around circuits of economic disparity and the distribution um, that often edges between what is visible and what is invisible. However, the task of decolonization is not simply structural, it's also human. And in Pintong's Broken Hill exhibition, we don't just see the act of attempting to delink from the West, but actually a relinking to other contexts and peoples outside of the West's borders. Broken Hill stretches what is permissible in the exhibitionary order, and in doing so is epistemically disobedient for the sake of studying together through the contact zone, which ultimately disentangles us from the colonial predicament of a world divided between ourselves and invisible others. We'll pass on to Pamela now. Thank you, Vera. So um, I'd like to open a discussion of the work by the London-based British Singaporean artist, Erica Tan, by sharing something the artist said at a seminar organized by the University of Arts London Decolonizing Arts Institute. Erica was asked to respond to the question, what should the point of a collection be? To this, she responded by first asking, what is culture and what are we collecting? Taking a cue from a recent text by Coco Fusco titled, <clears throat> We Need New Institutions, Not New Art, Erica emphasized that there is so much cultural activity and artistic production that is never collected and thus never receives institutional, hence historical recognition and representation. As such, it is inherently impossible for such institutions to reflect culture, and we should not pretend that they can. She then went on to consider how museums and institutional collections can attempt to address this through alternative modes of collaboration and curation, through the active creation of opportunities and situations that present new ways of working with materials that in her words, don't sit too happily and comfortably on walls. Erica underscores here the problematic notion that a museum collection can be decolonized or serve as the basis for cultural representation when the very notions of incompleteness and misrepresentation are fundamental to the constitution of an object-centered collection. Her interest in objects with no shadows or those things and practices which are formless, fugitive, ill-defined, or that remain unilluminated, unactivated, unperformed due to their perpetual residence in storage and the archives threads through much of her practice. The project that I'm sharing here, titled The Forgotten Weaver, 2016 to 2019, hinges on a spectral historical figure, Halima Binti Abdullah, a Malayan weaver who performed her craft at the 1924 British Empire Exhibition in London as part of the Malaya Pavilion exhibit. Following their work together on the 2011 to 2013 exhibition, Camping and Tramping Through the Colonial Archive, the museum in Malaya, Erica was alerted by our discussant, Shabir Hussein Mustafa, to Halima's presence as a footnote in archival documents that noted her participation in and her death during the Empire exhibition and her burial in an unmarked grave in Woking, England, which he encouraged Erica to locate. Her subsequent work on Halima developed in various iterations as she continued to collaborate with Mustafa on another project, Come Cannibalize Us, Why Don't You?, undertaken at the National University of Singapore Museum in 2014. I'd like to emphasize the interesting use of the metaphor of cannibalism with its complex dimensions of violation and incorporation that underscored both camping and tramping in 2011, and then more explicitly, in Come Cannibalize Us in 2014. As Wenny Teo pointed out, museological cannibalism describes the museum turning on itself by subjecting its own institutional foundations to radical critique. This is a decolonial provocation that is worth thinking further, but for now I'll return to Erica Tan's work on the Forgotten Weaver series. 
comprising staged debates and filmed performances, as well as or alongside installations with weaving, uh, weaving looms and digital projections, iterations of the project were shown in Venice, Holland, China, Singapore, Malaysia, and the UK from roughly 2015 to 2019. At the core of the series are questions about the gaps in historical and art historical narratives, alternative definitions and modes of repatriation, and the fluidity of artistic presence and subjectivity. Now, most agree that a central definition of decolonization concerns notions of reparation, of persons, of objects, of land, of rights. Contrasted with this tangible, material, and juridical definition, the concepts of decoloniality and de-imperialization have been theorized as holding the potential to reach into deep ideological terrain, into imagination itself as crucial to affecting lasting change. However, <clears throat> scholars and artists have cautioned against the notion that restitution and the reworking of curatorial methods serve as acts of, resol uh, acts of resolution. As art historian Nana Aduse Poku has argued, quote, museums that adopt this language don't have to deal with their inherent racism. They merely need to find different ways to display collections of stolen indigenous art. And the question here is that such museological solutions are palliative stopgaps or a way of filling absence that actually perpetuates forgetting and erasure. This is where I find the material presence of absence an absence that is at times exacerbated by an excess of performativity and presence in Erica's Halimas series to be provocative and unsettling. And it is the latter that must describe the work of decolonization, work that is intentionally troubling and difficult. <clears throat> in the Halimas series, Voice, in particular, is foregrounded as metaphor and material in staging discourses of repatriation, reconstitution, and agency. There are two components in particular of the project where voice is used as a form of performative excess and as a means of giving form to historical rep representation, but also to representation itself. One is a staged debate in, integrated into the 2017 moving image work Apajika, the Misplaced Comma, commissioned by the National Gallery Singapore for their experimental digital platform, Unrealized, linked to their permanent displays of modern art from Singapore and Southeast Asia. The digital platform sought to provide new ways to open the displays to multiple perspectives and tangents of inquiry. As described by the artist, Apajika, quote, takes the form of debate as central to the discussions around Halima's relevance in a national institution currently engaged in post-colonial reframing of modernism. The work is cited in a former colonial law court in a country where open debate and freedom of speech is highly monitored. The video brings together the displaced deconstructed loom, a performer of Malay dance, and a group of young Chinese female debaters who deliberate on the legacy of the empire exhibition, the position of craft, the validity of archival returns, and the notion of representation. The other component I mentioned, titled Presentation by Proxy, is striking in that it was originally created as supplemental to the project, but I think it is now integral to it. It is a single channel video lecture performance presented in Erica's absence when she was unable to attend the 2013 Singapore book launch of Come Cannibalize Us, Why Don't You? published as an extension to the NUS Museum exhibition. She created the persona of Halima through a digitized computer voice with an Indonesian accent, the voice expressing apologies for Erica's absence and speaking on her behalf to present Halima's story to the audience. Erica was conscious of the tensions and risks at work in these attempts to resurrect the historical figure through such contrived forms of speech. As the debaters in Apajika, the misplaced comma note, when you try to speak as those who cannot be present, you risk speaking for them. Representation as superimposition and performative resolution. Speaking as and not for Halima 
is a central quandary in the work, a task literally realized in Tan's efforts to recreate Halima's historical presence through the computerized reenactment of her voice, <clears throat> a gesture both melancholy and deliberately wry. Tan's scripting of Halima's monologue and digital constitution of her voice asks the question of not just how she is ventriloquizing Halima through vocal configuration, but to what extent does the artist want Halima to ventriloquize her? We might see the artist here as a medium in both senses of the word. As Tan notes, this compulsion to speak as and inevitably for Halima is a fraught endeavor. And the question of the ethics of representation is an immediate concern. The use of the computerized, heavily accented voice with its occasional semantic glitches and its mediatic anachronicity make this tension self-evident. The ever-presentness of this predicament also manifests in the debate form and its dialectical prog uh, progression of statements that recur in cuts throughout Apogeeka. In the debate staging in Singapore, set in the conjoined buildings of the former City Hall and Supreme Court building, chosen to serve as the architecture for the new National Gallery Singapore, which opened in 2015, Tan's choices of performativity, including monologue, dance, and debate, each of which rely on the body and or the voice, interact with the structure's history and its transformation. For Tan, this moment of transition represented a liminal moment between a juridical architecture that performed Singapore's modern identity and the opening of a museological institution that affirms its historical and national modernism. As Tan described, this was a site in the process of becoming, akin to the status of a work in a studio or performances in the process of rehearsal. The form of the debate itself becomes the, sorry, the form of the debate itself performs the possibility of open speech and public dialogue in a context where such a discursive form may at times find itself subject to constraint. The debaters attempt to sound out a logic of representation for Halima by performing orality as juridical process, returning to the historical premise of the site and of the enlightenment based rationale of the voice as a medium of justice. If one of the central questions at the heart of Tan's project is that of Halima's subjectivity and how to make her present when all we, that we know of her exists in a footnote, the voice is more than a medium. It is one of the metaphors of incompleteness that recur throughout the project from the filmed installation in progress of the Cham Loom in the Singapore galleries of the National Gallery Singapore to the very issue of art historiography and the place of women and craft. But for me, voice, scripted, performed, constructed, provides a compelling hinge to the works throughout the project. The digitized voice in particular gives unsettling form to absence, whereas embodiment or the live presence of bodies in action has often played a role in museological efforts um, <clears throat> to provide context for their objects. For example, using craftsmen to perform the production of objects on display. The ways in which Erica stages voice throughout the project as both embodiment and disembodiment sustains an at times uncomfortable sense of spectrality and indeterminacy. Such liminality also underscores the shape of the multi-year project as a series of fragments and its iterations of incompleteness. So I will leave it there and um, hand it over to Stephen to introduce our discussant, Mustafa. Great. Uh, thank you both, uh, Pamela and Vera, for a very enlightening, very interesting talk that took us from Africa to Indonesia to Singapore to Thailand and, and back, I think. Um, yeah, so anyway, I will hand this over to, um, to our discussant, uh, Shabir Hussein Mustafa. He's probably no stranger to many of you here. He is a senior curator at the National Gallery of Singapore um, and the Singapore Art Museum. Um, at the gallery, he leads the curatorial team overseeing Between Declarations and Dreams, a multi-year exhibition that surveys Southeast Asian perspectives from the 19th century to the present. And I can think of no better person than to respond to this, um, this presentation. So yeah, Mustafa, over to you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And, and, and thank you to the organizers for having me and 
of course, uh, Vera and Pamela for allowing me to share some thoughts about their presentations. Um, I've, uh, I've, I've sort of prepared a, a, a short text, uh, which I'll kind of go through. And as I'm, I'm kind of making my way through it, um, I'll offer some, some, some questions uh, for, for, for our speakers uh, today. Um, over the past few days, as I said about attempting to digest Vera and Pamela's thoughts, uh, a friend suggested I take a look at uh, Julieta Singh's uh, recent and not so recent book, uh, Unthinking Mastery, Dehumanism and Decolonial Entanglements, a, a sustained study of how mastery as an ideological, material and dialectical concept works across a range of contexts from the private confines of the home to the classroom, in humanitarian projects, neoliberal networks, and in relation to our conversation today, anti-colonial movements and their reflexes. Unthinking Mastery is a sprawling and fantastic read, and from my point of view, offers such incredible insights into a range of matters that I have been invested in as part of my own curatorial work. As a result, the thoughts I offer today um, are coming from this space of the curatorial a space filled with uh, contradictions, uh, but also possibilities uh, within the evol ever evolving, uh, constantly evolving context of Singapore and by extension, uh, Southeast Asia. This is also a type of work that is informed by uh, what I call the insults uh, of the colonial, uh, and something I critique in my own humble way as a worker who operates uh, through its kind of resultant mechanisms and uh, provincialisms. But going back to unthinking mastery, uh, I want to highlight that the book uh, is not alone in its enterprise of seeking change, but is couched within the disciplinary formation of post-colonial studies, something that is also at the heart of, of what we are trying to get at today. And it draws from the wide spectrum that has emerged in light of anti-colonial revolts, you know, the so-called spectrum for, that stretches across an array of speakers from Sadhus and Alatas to Pat Spivak. What makes Unthinking Mastery particularly intriguing uh, for our conversation at hand today as well is the author's refusal to offer a definition of mastery itself. Instead, the book offers three key features uh, through which mastery may be identified by mastery mutilates, mastery subordinates, and mastery requires hierarchized relations. I hope I got that right. In order to highlight the thesis, Singh conducts discourse analysis, you know, in a classical kind of Foucauldian sense, I suppose, weaving in her own biographical positions uh, along the way on two figures, uh, Franz Fanon, uh, already evoked by uh, Vera earlier, and Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, you know, the, 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 the liberator uh, of, of, of India uh, in one way uh, or another. Singh observes, uh, and I quote, I quote Singh here, across anti-colonial discourse, the mastery of the colonizer over the colonies was a practice that was explicitly disavowed. And yet in their efforts to decolonize, anti-colonial thinkers in turn advocated practices of mastery. These could be corporeal, linguistic, and intellectual towards their own liberation, close quote. Singh then continues, and I quote again, for thinkers as diverse as Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi and Franz Fanon, decolonization was an act of undoing mastery by producing new masterful subjects. I argue, and this is still Singh speaking, that this discourse of anti-colonialism, which was geared towards the future, did not interrogate thoroughly enough its own masterful engagements. It did not dwell enough, in other words, on how its complex entanglements with mastery would come to resonate in the post-colonial future it so passionately anticipated. With Fanon, Singh, Singh, Singh breaks down his thoughts to discuss forms of political masculinism and the universal male subject he desired as an alternative to the colonial subject, who of course came at the expense of gendered subjectivities. With Gandhi, and this has been of course discussed in the literature uh, by by a range of scholars uh, from the subcontinent as well. His notion of Swaraj or self-rule uh, involved the reconstitution of a male post-colonial subject that came in the face of women as keepers of age old practices without agency. In effect, mastery and our constant attempts at countering or resisting it have led us to create a series of regimes being established such that the colonial formation just came to be replaced with a post-colonial shape. Despite all the inclusive aims of figures like Gandhi and Fanon, a range of groups have come to be left behind. 
and I quote Singh here again, from colonized women, indigenous peoples, the uncivilized groups of the emergent nation state, the animal and nature itself, close quote. Long story short, Unthinking Mastery says, and I quote again, there is an intimate link between the mastery enacted through colonization and other forms of mastery that we often believe today to be harmless, worthwhile, even virtuous, close quote. I think the use of the word virtuous is an interesting choice, something we could keep in view as we make our way through the conversation today. The adjective virtuous and its related noun virtuosity also has a tradition within art history, marking great technical skill. Suffice to say, the argument being forwarded here is critical in reading present times. If we are to recognize the complexity and contradictions within decolonial maneuvers, we need to recognize the paradox of mastery itself. So it's undoing can enable insights into contemporary practice, something that is at the heart of our conversation today, and globalize life itself, right? So the movement of, 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 of beings, bodies, knowledge systems, ideas, right? Uh, in much more fluid ways than, than we had expected 300 years ago. And although Singh refuses to define mastery, I want to kind of stay with this for just a little longer. The theorist does offer some way out of this double bind by adopting a stance of dehumanism, which is provisionally defined as a practice of recuperation, stripping away of violent foundations of colonial and neo-colonial mastery that continue to render some beings more human than others. For dehumanism to take effect, the subject would need to engage in, and this is an expression I borrow, vulnerable reading by inhabiting ourselves differently and allowing for these vulnerable subjects to speak to each other in modes that are ambivalent and grounded in a kind of a really mess of contradictions and entanglements. So the mess is a good thing in this sense. It's a productive thing. The final effect being an unlearning of human subjectivity itself with the hope of a better future. So here comes uh, my first query for our speakers today. In our surveys of the projects you discuss, and I'm not asking you or asking both of you to speak on behalf of the artists, but as sort of channels that think through the artworks, when we think about subjectivities as they're represented in the works, are there moments when mastery is unlearned or rendered ambivalent? Vera, you alluded to this by saying that all forms of culture carry colonial dimensions. This is a quote from you. Pamela, you call it after Walter Mignolo, and I quote, undoing the rhetoric that sustains a relationship between the aesthetic and the epistemic. I wonder how we may read Mr. Chisala, the Broken Hill Man Skull, and Puan Halima Binti Abdullah, and the Charm Loom today. What do their subjectivities as represented within the art gesture towards? Do the contradictions and entanglements that inhabit their representation offer some sort of an insight into a more equitable future? Or is this too much to ask from contemporary art? It's a question I have. Yeah, I haven't resolved it myself. Maybe that's why I keep going to work every day. Um, my own point of view with regards to the Broken Hill Man skull and by extension, uh, the entangled Mr. Chisala and the figure of Halima Binti Abdullah and the case of the entangled Cham Loom is guided by this quote, actually, which comes from Shamset Tabriz, the teacher of the Persian poet Rumi. And this is a quote, he says, one person makes a thousand efforts to show something from himself and another hides himself with a hundred tricks. I would contend that the artistic projects we grapple with today suggest to us that the figure who shows himself and the figure who hides are indeed the same. They are merely shades of the same combination. And so the more one attempts to make them apparent, the more trouble they, they create. So, so let me repeat the quote again. One person makes a thousand efforts to show something from himself and another hides himself with a hundred tricks. And maybe this is precisely the point. And perhaps it is here that we should stay. 
you know, with the trouble, so to speak. I mean, of course, borrowing from Donna Haraway, you know, the, the suggestion of to stay with the trouble, so to speak. I now want to move into a second feature of my response. I'm kind of reaching the end. Uh, to dwell deeper into the methods of working that are being discussed in your respective papers. And here I draw upon my own limited sort of competence in the field of curating. Goes without saying that the curatorial is tethered to the cultural object in its myriad shape-shifting forms, you know, from painting, sculpture, installatives, archives, film, artifacts, photography, to basically all forms of the culture crafts. But the curatorial is also inter inter intertwined in the circulation of these cultural objects, in its treatment and conservation uh, uh, contradictions, and also the cultural object's ability to open up space for challenging perceptions of what it means to collect, speak, and distribute them today. At the heart of this work is a struggle for power between a range of vulnerable and less vulnerable human and non-human beings. I sometimes wonder in late stage capitalism as older conventions are undone, I have also wondered what is left in its wake, what stays and what departs. How can we develop modes of working that exercise things called for an active vulnerability and ambivalence? How can we make the transitional space for the circulation of objects this space, which is at once inhabitable, but also mutable, known and yet to be known, seen and unseen? As a result, two further questions uh, emerge. And, and, and I, I suppose this is really a kind of an invitation to unpack observations that you've already made uh, in, 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 in your papers. First, uh, Prachaya and Erika are both filmmakers. Could you talk about the role the filmic um, medium plays in relation to the two projects at hand? You know, that is for the Broken Hill and the, the Forgotten Weaver. And does the process of making film become a means or maybe even an excuse to go places and explore paradoxes? What sort of potencies do the films in particular generate in relation to the, 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 the decolonial? So I'm kind of something that is locked no, between the medium, um, uh, the creator, so to speak, uh, and the site uh, within which it is produced, you know, uh, in, in quite literally as well. Second, uh, both projects engage with museology in a, in a direct manner, right? There is no ambiguity here. I mean, it is really a kind of a engagement with museology, however one wants to define it, context to context, variations, uh, assuming all variations are given. And as a result, actively intervene into the process of exhibition making itself. Now, could you both reflect a little bit more upon the performative elements both projects generate in relation to the museum? Is the aim here to, to kill the museum while trying to revive it at the same time? <laughs> you know, uh, is it a kind of a, we get a kind of a double bind, I guess? Or is the museum uh, an, an irritation? You know? And I, I, I liken the museum to a sort of a headache that refuses to go away, whereby the headache is not verbal or visual or emotional, although it is all of these things. It's a kind of a condition whereby you can work, eat, drive, nap, write, but the headache remains. There is no remedy, except the realization that in all the cultural objects that surround me, they simultaneously carry and denounce all previous identities. Um, yeah, this may be a kind of, uh, uh, a, a response, I think, I suppose, uh, to, to, to the question of the, of the museum uh, and, 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 and what, uh, what we may do with it uh, today. Yeah. So maybe I'll leave it there and perhaps, uh, yeah, love to hear from, from our speakers. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mr. But yeah, I'll, I'll hand this directly to, to Pamela and Vera. Thank you. Vera, do you want to go first? <laughs> or I can. Uh, okay. Sure. Um, on, um, maybe, maybe you go first. Um, I'm formulating. So. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Mustafa, for your questions. I, I confess I have notes because I had to, I read through your script a few times because the questions are so incredibly profound that I'm not even going to pretend to have 
sort of satisfying answers to that. <laughs> But, <laughs> I, didn't, um, I, didn't, I didn't intend to, 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 to be that. Yeah, no, sorry. Sorry to disturb. Yeah. No, I, I love it because you actually you pulled out some of the things that I hope to dwell or spend more time on um, in a longer piece on Erica's work. And um, I actually wanted to go back to an earlier part before you sort of formally gave us a couple questions. You gave us some things to think about. Um, this question of representation and subjectivity. Um, you were you asked, I wonder how we may read Mr. Kamfwa Chisala and Juan Halima Binti Abdullah today. What do their subjectivities as represented within the, the arts gesture towards? Do the contradictions and entanglements that inhabit their representation offer some sort of insight into a more equitable future or is this too much to ask from contemporary art? Um, on that note, I was just thinking about the difference between subjectivity and representation. And, you know, um, we, can, we can think about artistic subjectivity. That's one of the advantages of contemporary art is that we have a chance to actually get to know artists in our time. And <clears throat> we can sort of formulate ideas about their subjectivity. But anything of the past, um, anything historical or art historical, we can only construct a representation. You know, we, we can only make guesses or estimations about subjectivity. And really, you know, what we construct, these representations, they have more to say about our subjectivity today than the subjectivities of those historical figures who will always be kind of spectral. And so there's a lot about the Halima project, which the artist, which Erica has even explained, has a lot to do with herself as a mixed race British Singaporean artist based in London who um, is often uh, sort of categorized in curatorial ways or in exhibitions, um, you know, as a kind of hybrid subject or, you know, she was exhibited in the diaspora pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Um, and so there's ways in which she's kind of speaking through Halima, right? And so that's why I use this analogy of ventriloquism to think about the way she's constructing that voice and thinking, okay, she ventriloquizing Halima, so she, or she's actually trying to have Halima speak for her, give her a voice as to these quandaries of subjectivity and identity. Um, and then you had also commented about, um, you, you mentioned Vera's quote, um, that all forms of culture carry colonial dimensions. And, you know, me quoting Mignolo um, about, uh, un, you know, sort of undoing the rhetoric that sustains a relationship between the aesthetic and the epistemic as crucial to decolonial work. And I guess this is something I continue to grapple with is this idea of undoing as an impossibility, right? Um, and is it enough to say that exposing something is an act of undoing, you know, um, undoing meaning, you know, giving us the sense that something can be reverted, you know, we can revert back to a previous state that we can undo. Can we ever undo learning? You can never undo learning. You can learn more things. You can accumulate new ideas, but you can't unlearn or undo things. Um, so I guess I, just along those lines, I was thinking about, well, so what is, what is the crux of decolonial work then or decolonizing work? And we know what it is on the one hand as something that is about restitution and reparation and it's about justice and rights, but in terms of it, the ideological work, um, you know, it is about bringing certain forms of rhetoric, certain mechanisms of ideology into focus to the point of disturbance, right? To the point where one is profoundly unsettled and something happens there, um, but it's not a form of undoing, or, you know? So I guess this is where I, I I grapple with Mignolo's idea of delinking, right? Um, okay, so as for the question about filmmaking, um, so narrative is so crucial to Erica's work um, and movement and duration, speech, script, dialogue. Um, it's really hard to imagine it taking place in any other medium especially because the sound is so important to her work um, and sight, right? The setting, you know, it's hard to, the, the power of the debate is 
amplified by its setting. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess, so for me, it's, it's just hard to imagine her work taking any other form. And then I guess one can also talk about film as something that's presumed to be a kind of inherently democratic medium that it, it, you know, it's not an object that has to be contained or just you know, put in one place that it has the potential to travel, be open access or accessible and sort of mutate into new forms. Um, and film can also be cannibalistic in a way, right? Um, it can reuse and edit and, you know, um, sample from other films and things like that. And that's where a lot of ideological critique can, can take place. Um, and then the question about the performative elements that both projects generate in relation to the museum. Um, yes, I think it is, it's a crucial context for the Halima work, even though it's not the same as the Minulo interventions or, you know, couple in the cage, and it's not centered around a specific object. Um, it really picks up on certain fragments of things. Um, it's a kind of aura. I think the museum, in a sense, it's a kind of aura for the work. And is the aim here to kill the museum while trying to revive it? I don't think we should ever kill museums. I think um, <laughs> they're so historically and ideological loaded that they're um, they're really valuable, and they are they are still you know probably they are the number one sort of public resource of art, you know, they are a public art historical resource. It's still, you know, the place where, you know, sort of transformative encounters can happen in terms of, you know, audiences and objects. And there's still so many possibilities for alternative ways of engaging with those objects. And one thing I was going to bounce back to you as a question, Mustafa, was um, if you could talk about Unrealized, the digital platform, maybe after Vera goes, because I'd love to hear more about the conception of that, which I think is fantastic. Um, sure. So I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna stop here and I'll pass it to Vera if you wanna respond. Thank you. Uh, I, like Pamela, also took notes, but um, needed to digest um, a lot of the brilliant um, response that you formulated for us. I guess I wanted to um, think about the text that you reference by Julieta Singh, Unthinking Mastery, and, you know, can't help but um, think about, I mean, some of my own research, but this moment in Bandung, um, where in the opening communique, um, President Sukarno, who's an Indone um, Indonesian independence president who opens this sort of historic conference, uh, opens with this line, which is, we are masters of our own house again. And, you know, we all know how this turns out, right, when one uh, colonial regime leaves it's not like this sort of um yeah this decolonial moment in some senses was short-lived but um i wanted to think i guess more about your the the term or the method that uh singh uses is it this method of vulnerability did you say um or like how to be open and and yeah using that to think about i guess in some respects um Prachaya's work and his, um, you know, his friendship, his, yeah, I, I don't know what else to call it. I don't think, you know, I don't necessarily think collaboration is the right term, uh, but the, it's a very sort of human encounter um, that happens between them. And that happens when you visit the exhibition. It's not um, just an encounter with an object, but something happens in this face-to-face -face interaction, which, you know, I guess I could draw upon from Levinas, it's like, that we owe an ethical responsibility to when we have a face-to-face -face interaction. Um, I'm not sure how that links to this idea of dehumanizing because in some respects, I feel like that en entrenches the kind of human aspect of, of ethics and responsibilities that we have um, yeah, towards the material when we know that it comes from you know, this encounter with a person. Um, Oh, and that, yeah, and that this idea of vulnerability that Singh talks about, uh, um, you know, the term vulnerability, I, I guess I, I was interested in looking at it, but it, it, you know, the etymology of it translates as an openness to being wounded, which is kind of actually similar to this idea of um, exposure and uh, which comes from 
the word exposition, which, you know, in French means exhibition as well. So there's a kind of interesting, I guess, relationship um, in, in these kind of methods. Um, but yeah, in this exposure, uh, an, em an empathy happens, in, you know, in this exposure to the kind of face-to-face -face encounter um, that I think, yeah, as a methodology, it's, it's you know, yeah, I guess, yeah, again, this idea of decolonization is not simply kind of structural or conceptual, but, you know, how do we kind of, I guess, implicate these like very kind of human needs, yeah, for justice, but also for, I guess, understanding each other within this process. Um, in terms of, oh, the ambivalence that you cite, um, yeah, to stay with the trouble. And I think in the original notes, um, you say, how can we develop projects that exercise things call for an active vulnerability and ambivalence? And I, I think that's what's really kind of wonderful about um, contemporary curatorial practice, at least, is it kind of, there's so much you can, you know, hide behind in a way that you can kind of mask as an artistic project, but maybe is actually operating as something else entirely. Um, that might not be material at all. And, you know, and I think in some ways, Prachaya bringing Mr. Chishala to London, which is something that he wanted to do. It's an opportunity that Mr. Chishala had that he would never have had if it wasn't for this project. Um, you know, um, Prachaya was telling me that he'd never left Zambia before, you know, he'd never get to see the original skull without, I guess, this kind of, you know, this mask or this charade of, a, of an art project, which, yeah, again, is why I kind of like this idea that you know there is this kind of smuggling capacity of curatorial practice and that in some ways I think you know we have a responsibility to sort of I guess as curators to sort of um, play to that you know and to sort of be disobedient ourselves within these institutional structures that we're often employed by um, Yeah, um, oh, in terms of the filmmaking. So yeah, Prachaya didn't um, make the film. He commissioned a Zambian filmmaker to make the film. And I think in both um, instances with the project, so as part of the um, the project Broken Hill, he also gave um, Mr. Chisala a camera that, you know, he then took photos around London and then those photos were exhibited as well. They were left in a stack on top of the, the box that the um, replica skull came in that people could kind of peruse. But, you know, he has no sort of ownership or copyright on any of those things. But this kind of very direct action, I guess, of, of giving the camera and giving the kind of resource away to this filmmaker, you know, directly from the voice um, of the place that they're representing. I think, again, it speaks to this idea of resource distribution, which, I, you know, I think is really um, going to become um, more pertinent within, like, sort of direct decolonial method. It's, you know... It's going to be, I guess, yeah, I feel like there will be sort of more demand for like really direct as opposed to sort of conceptual methods around decoloniality. But um, yeah, I think maybe I'll um, stop my response there. Great. Um, I'm conscious of time. Mustafa, do you want to quickly talk about the the project they both alluded to? And then I, then, then I think we should take yeah. some of the, the um, questions from the audience. Sure, uh, quick one. Um, no, I just wanted to kind of respond uh, quickly. Um, you know, my 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 earlier kind of provocation. No? Uh, like we got to kill the museum and revive it at the same time. I I, I actually do think uh, that if we are to exercise uh, vulnerability, um, I suppose the space uh, for contemporary practice, however one chooses to define it, um, is quite ideal. Uh, in, 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 in this regard, uh, largely also because uh, emphasis is, I mean, this is, this is uh, kind of connected to the unrealized uh, uh, response as well, that the emphasis is on, on process uh, itself. And uh, the outcomes are, uh, are, 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 are fluid, uh, somewhat mutable, I suppose, uh, and kind of left uh, uh, to, to form or unform, right? Uh, maybe even see and maybe not see, uh, uh, and 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 and, but as a, as a result, generate uh, a conversation, even such as this. Um, uh, just going back to un unrealized, um, um, it started off when uh, myself and, and 
colleagues at the gallery uh, were developing uh, the, the inaugural hang of the, of the Singapore galleries. So I, I was affiliated with Singapore galleries in the first couple of years of the National Gallery. And uh, we were kind of wondering um, what exactly was at, at stake and whether uh, the, the formation uh, that was happening uh, within uh, the gallery uh, was something that uh, needed um, analysis and critical analysis. And uh, as a result, we invited uh, three artists. Uh, we invited uh, uh, Hee Chong, Ho Zun Yen, and Erica Tan. And uh, we kind of said to them, hey, you know, you can, you can find ways to generate uh, whatever it is that you feel is required at this moment in time. This is what we're doing. Um, they also had uh, access to the galleries themselves. You kind of see that uh, to some extent in, in, in Erica's films and also in uh, Zunian's films. Um, and uh, Heeman responded uh, by, by saying that he wanted to manage a Twitter feed. Uh, so he would kind of tweet on a daily basis with kind of cannibalized uh, titles of past exhibitions that went all the way back to 2000, uh, 1819, uh, formation of Singapore, I suppose, uh, until 2015, right, which was also the, 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 the year in which the National Gallery uh, opens. Uh, Zunian, on the other hand, uh, responded uh, with uh, this print that has been at the center of debates uh, in his own work. Uh, it's a print of a tiger kind of pouncing out of out of the Singapore jungles and 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 in a sense seemingly attacking GD Coleman kind of a colonial surveyor uh, engineer who built some of the kind of colonial structures in Singapore uh, but the print is made by a German uh, engraver by the name of Heinrich Leutemann uh, but Zunian actually looks at uh, the Indian convict labor that surrounds GD Coleman and uh, then as a result began to develop conversations uh, with migrant workers in Singapore and so on. So, so it's all there in the film, uh, in a kind of surrealist way. And then Erica's work uh, came out of that. Uh, but uh, right from the start, uh, it was a formless project uh, in a sense. It was never meant to be displayed. Uh, eventually we resolved that it would be kind of exhibited through the galleries app. This was all the way in 2015. This is not like now when apps are the rage or whatever. Um, and uh, that was sort of it. Um, there is a kind of a publication that I've been making but never finished. Uh, shows my degrees of competence, I suppose. Um, but it's, it's actually called, uh, this is not a publication, uh, which is essentially just boxes filled with archival documents that I've been gathering on museology and curating in Singapore uh, since the 19th century. So these are kind of things that I'm just doing uh, on the side, which are connected to these methods of, of thinking and, and, and working. Um, often they, they, they materialize, sometimes they don't, but that's okay. We don't have to push everything out for the sake of productivity, right? So I think it's trying to kind of grapple uh, with these questions curatorially as, as, as well, yeah. Um, I did have one question, uh, Stephen, for both our speakers, if if I could squeeze it in. Okay, we gotta be quick though. Yeah, and okay. quick responses, I think. Yeah, I have uh, one question, and maybe we, we don't need to address it, but it's just a question. Both Erica and Prachai actually work through proxies. Um, and, and this is interesting, I think, and maybe it was something that we could discuss uh, at some point. Yeah, just, just a comment for the moment. We could go through Q&A, Q no? I think. Just, it's just a comment. That I okay, have. sure, yeah. yeah. All right, let me, let me take some of the questions. Um, all right, I, um, the first one is a, a specific uh, question about, um, from Malenka, about Fred Wilson's work. Um, she says, uh, they say the artistic method of juxtaposing, how would you comment the, <clears throat> on the fact that the audience misinterpreted the whipping pole as in relation to slavery? I find it important because it reminds us of the manipulating nature of display, I think then this is a quote from Fred Wilson that says, although the post was built around 1885 and had never been used on slaves, many of those who saw the exhibit left the museum certain it, that it had been employed for that very purpose. There's my doorbell. <laughs> um, so I'm going to take that. Okay. Um. I don't know if that diminishes the impact of the work, to be honest with you. I mean, even if it had never actually been put to use, I mean, it's the power of the symbol, right? 
this, this sort of the force of the symbol and uh, juxtaposed in such a way. I don't think that there's anything sort of manipulative or insidious about, about what he's doing. Um, that's just my opinion. I don't think it diminishes the, the work. It could reflect the, the effectiveness of it actually that even, you know, that, that this post wasn't used in that manner, but the, it created, it evoked that, that belief in the visitors. Yeah. Um, does anyone want to follow up or I feel I should move on to this? Um, yeah, I think the second question, we've talked about it a bit, but if anybody wants to maybe jump in again, um, what would you say are the key museum practices which are relevant to the process of museum decolonization? Also, what would you say are the main areas for future research and practice of museum decolonization? What is the next step? What needs more work? I mean, Mustafa has, has talked about that quite a bit. Um, do either of you want to follow up a little bit or? <clears throat> it's a big question, obviously. All right, I think, yeah, we, you know, I, um, okay. All right, Phoebe, um, Scott, one of Mustafa's colleagues <clears throat> has um, a question. Thank you for the excellent presentation. One matter that perhaps was not discussed at length was the type of contemporary art projects you describe are quite often commissioned by museums or supported by museum residencies. I was wondering if you might say more about the implications of this. I also wonder if, despite their intentions, these kind of initiatives can run the risk of devolving the museum's responsibilities to decolonize onto the commissioned artist. Um, I'm not referring here specifically to National Gallery of Singapore, yes, good disclaimer. Yeah, this is something I, I, um, I wonder as well myself, you know, I don't, I don't deal with contemporary but I, I sometimes I feel that as well that that you know artists and empire springs to mind for me, and um, where, where where you know the critical voice of the decolonizing voice is sort of sidestepped by curators and put onto the contemporary artists. So I think that is maybe something we could spend a few minutes discussing right now. Well, I think this kind of goes back to this methodology of vulnerability, perhaps that is suggested through the Julieta Singh, where you know ultimately we have to put like curators have to put themselves on the line and not kind of hide behind an institution, um, you know, be direct in the authoring um, and the challenging from within and make that a bit more transparent and obvious, I guess. Um, that would be my, yeah, because I do think it is problematic to outsource risk onto an artist. Um, yeah, that would be my response. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a this is a question and a critique that has been circulating in a lot of debates and discussions, right? Where it just seems that the work of decolonization on behalf of the museum through such commissioned forms of institutional critique is a kind of performative armature for the museum, right? It, um, and that's where people are asking, you know, what's really going on behind the scenes in terms of, you know how many curators are people of color, you know, and who holds the power and what kinds of, you know, um, who are the stakeholders in the museum. So that's where, you know, it's not just about, let's, it's not just about the museum putting on these, these exhibitions or inviting these forms of institutional critique, but it's also about what kinds of forms of material um, and even political change are happening at the heart of the museum in terms of the power structures, right? And the, the sources of capital that are supporting the institutions. So I think, you know, people do see beyond the exhibition making and the curatorial aspect and are, are levying critiques at the, the power structures behind the museums. Great, yeah. Mustafa, do you have any follow-up or will I go on to the next? Um, no, just to say that uh, the, the context in which we operate in Singapore is rather unique. I think, uh, you know, uh, as far as I know, Singapore had not colonized another nation state. So I think uh, the space uh, from which uh, the curator speaks uh, is also quite important uh, within all of this. And of course, the work itself, I mean, the exhibitions must also advance uh, these questions. And I mean, personally, I, I do advance these questions in my projects. Uh, 
in one way uh, or another. So I think it comes down to that. Uh, it's a kind of uh, ethical uh, space. I spoke about it a little bit earlier uh, in my response as well. I mean, of course, the evocation of vulnerability, but also uh, the ethical self uh, that is uh, confronting, I think, uh, curatorial work, uh, maybe uh, uh, museology, I guess, in different ways, but uh, curatorial work uh, at this moment. I mean, the debate is already ongoing no? uh, amongst curators, I guess. So I think uh, this is a, this is an ongoing ongoing matter. I think, uh, yeah, as I say, let's let's fight. Let's do it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I uh, absolutely. Hopefully, this this series will contribute in some small way. Um, yeah. Okay. We have time for a few more. Actually, the, the next question was something that I was thinking about as well. Actually, from Mustafa, and you're um, referring to unthinking mastery. Yeah. I mean, you know, is the museum does the museum then in the post colonial become a form of of, of mastery as well, right? Um, which is probably one of the criticisms that could be definitely maybe has been leveled at museums within Southeast Asia as well and in terms of sort of what narratives or sort of nationalisms they promote. Um, but Eva San's question would be, yeah, would it be culturally appropriate to say that cultures contribute to some form of colonization in regards to indigenous cultures? And how do you argue that statement? It is having more power over animals and land, uh, given how they've been at the worst end of European colonialization, right? So there's maybe a bit to unpack there, but if anybody wants to respond. Oh yeah, so yeah, uh, obviously, yeah, I was meaning that specifically, I guess, this idea that all culture can carry from uh, dimensions of colonization, insidious or obvious, you know, uh, the taking of lands and um, oppressions of peoples into uh, systems of power that are foreign to them. Um, but I, yeah, and specifically, I was thinking about, I guess, situations in Southeast Asia where um, the colonizers leave and the indigenous people do take power and enact that power and territoriality over other peoples, often other indigenous peoples as well. And how do we negotiate that tension? Um, yeah, that's what I was, I guess, alluding to because, you know, um, yeah, we, we all know that after independence happens, it doesn't mean that the task of decolonization is over. Um, yeah, and that, you know, formerly colonized peoples um, sometimes enact colonial power um, through new regimes, as we've seen. Um, yeah, very firm examples in Southeast Asia, I think. So. That's a big question, and I think it's a historical question, too, because I, I don't know if there's anywhere in the world where if you look at historical examples of territorial expansion and state formation where some kind of imperialist or colonial project is not at work in terms of the infringing on you know, other people's lands and attempts to uh, culturalize them. You know? So you could look at Vietnamese history, for example. You know, Vietnam is very well known as having been colonized by China for a thousand years and then by the French and then you know, American occupation of a kind. But Vietnam also has the history of territorial expansion and Vietnamization of surrounding Khmer lands, Cham lands. So I think, I mean, it's a question to investigate historically. I think it, this kind of violence happens with any kind of territorial expansion, right, and state formation. Right, yeah, and I think I think in terms of the Vietnam, hopefully you and uh, presentation in a few weeks may touch on some of those points. Um, all right, I'm going to take one final question and then we have to wrap it up. And um, it's from Faisal, who's going to present next week with Conan. Um, yeah, so he's asking, um, with both examples, Broken Hill, Skull, and um, Eric Tan's work, the artists do not come from the communities presented and represented in the works. How does the fact that the artists probably earn money through the commissions of these works by the respective institutions from presenting another community's narratives and our histories add to the conversation on decolonizing the museum. And I apologize if it's improper to be talking about money. I did no need to apologize whatsoever. It's very appropriate to, to go straight, I think, to raise the issue of yeah, financial remuneration as well in these issues. So yeah, I'll leave it at that. 
Anybody want to follow up on, on that question? I guess I was trying to hint to that when I meant yeah. resource distribution. I meant literally money. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were more um, subtle about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was trying to be somewhat diplomatic or more elegant in my language. But um, yeah, you know, for example, yeah, funding um Mr. Chisala's trip to London and his stay there, I think is a form of resource sharing. I mean, I don't know the exact um, you know, nuances of that but you know that was not without significant for lack of a better term investment you know um yeah so i think yeah this is a very direct form of resource sharing sorry mustafa go um where i'll just add a kind of a footnote to that resources uh, not just in terms of money but also the power of passports yeah yeah, um, yeah. so who gets to go yeah. where is a real question yeah. Absolutely, uh, and I think I think this is uh, as connected. So I think it's a good question, uh, and and also forward. like how yeah, to we need um, a symposium by itself, <laughs> and how yeah, to facilitate not, not to pop out of it. Totally, and how to facilitate a visa? You know, I don't know if um, Mr. Chisala's work would have sent him without this loan agreement. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that's one way. I guess another way of smuggling that I like to think about it, at least. Great. Yeah, I think um, on that note, I'll probably have to call this um, really rich and uh, fascinating session to a close. I learned a lot. I think it's in, in maybe the best sense, it's raised as many questions as it has answers and things for us to keep thinking about throughout the series, but also um, in our practices and in our um, in our research. And I hope the audience found it um, worthwhile as well. Um, the, the recording will be up um, on the SOAS uh, Center for Southeast Asian Studies website. Uh, just bear with us, sometimes it takes a few days. There's a bit of back end work we need to do to get it up there. Um, so it will be up. Um, so thank you again. And yeah, so that just leaves me to, uh, on behalf of myself and Conan, yes, I'm sorry at the start, I forgot to mention that, of course, Conan is my partner in this uh, endeavor and he'll be presenting uh, next week with Faisal. Um, yeah, so on behalf of uh, SOAS and also the Asian Civilizations Museum, I'd like to thank uh, Pamela, Vera and Mustafa uh, for a really uh, wonderful uh, talk, presentation and discussion today, and of course the audience. So thank you everybody and hopefully see you again uh, next week. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much.